The Marvel Cinematic Universe is changing the way you think, influencing your opinions and ideology, and it's doing this in ways you've never even thought about. And no, I don't mean that it's communist propaganda because it includes female and non-white characters. I'm not going to be claiming that Kevin Feige's building an MCU to destroy traditional masculine values. No, I'm going to be talking about real and hidden ways in which today's popular drama and cinema, particularly the MCU, you could actually be influencing our society, politics and ideology more than we realise. And to explain why this might be the case, we'll be going on a journey of sorts from the philosophy of ancient Greece through the Renaissance and back to the present day. But before we get started on our odyssey of discovery, I'd like to thank my patrons for picking this video topic, because this is the first Pillar of Garbage community video, and I'll explain properly what that means at the end, but in short, this idea was created and selected by the people you see on screen now. So thanks guys, because this one turned out to be quite the interesting topic. Essentially, the thesis is as follows. There exist inbuilt structures of repression, political and ideological, within the very roots of Western drama and the ways we read and understand it, as well as its derivative forms such as film. What's more, as European drama and fiction changed in the Renaissance, as it began to emphasize and consolidate liberal individualist values, these structures of repression were co-opted by the nascent bourgeoisie and subsequently the dominant modes of drama for the past few hundred years have exerted a considerable almost propagandistic influence over their audiences. And the recent box office dominance exercised by Marvel in some ways shows these phenomena of covert repression more plainly than anything else today, both in the way its stories are structured and in the ways their characters succeed and fail. Now, that's a lot of big words and bold claims, but I'll do my best to break this all down. The main linchpins of this argument are certain ideas of Aristotle's, such as catharsis, virtue and mimesis, as well as Machiavelli's idea of virtue, and the philosophical and social changes it reflects. Specifically, I'll be approaching these concepts through the work of Augusto Boal, a Brazilian theatre practitioner and cultural theorist, so most of the stuff I'll be referencing and quoting you can find in his book Theatre of the Oppressed. I'll just let you know now that the next few minutes will be fairly theoretical, as I lay out the concepts which we'll go on to use later in the discussion of the MCU. If you want to skip to that part, or if this all gets a little confusing, I'll put some time codes in the description so you can see when to jump to. Though I don't really recommend doing this, because that part will likely also be tricky to grasp without having watched this next part through. But let's get into it. What am I talking about? We'll start with Aristotle, old Greek guy who had a few big ideas. That's pretty much who he was. And all you need to know more broadly is that his ideas on drama, literature, politics, medicine, physics, metaphysics, and so on, were like hugely significant for a lot of the time between his life and ours, particularly in the early modern period, a space of time in which much of the foundation of our world as we know it today was being laid in terms of art, literature, philosophy, science, and so on. For one, this sense of immense influence rings true for Aristotle's text De Poetica, or The Poetics, as there's evidence it was being read around the time playwrights like Shakespeare, Haywood, Webster or Marlowe were writing, but this work isn't just significant because people read it afterwards. It's significant because it was an analysis of the drama and poetry of Aristotle's time, and the literature of the centuries preceding his life. Ancient Greek epic, tragedy, comedy, the fundaments of Western storytelling, modern theatre, and more significantly for the purposes of this video, modern cinema, still use many of the basic dramatic conventions of ancient Greek drama. So a lot of the observations Aristotle was making in the poetics are applicable in one way or another, not merely to the literature of his own time, but also the cinema and fiction of ours though not always straightforwardly. So yeah, Aristotle developed theories and models for how storytelling worked. I'm not going to detail it all here because this video would literally be hours long, but the main thing I want to bring up is that according to Augusto Boal, people who read the poetics today aren't considering the philosophical background in which Aristotle was working, and they aren't paying close enough attention to the specific terminology he uses. Because when you do pay close enough attention to these things, Boal suggests, it becomes clear that for Aristotle drama is essentially political, but there's a couple of stages to this, so let's start off simple. You might have heard the phrase, art imitates nature. That's Aristotle, well, sort of half him and half Plato, but keeping it simple, that's Aristotle. Mimesis is the Greek term for this principle, and it's often taken to just mean that 
Art imitates nature, or the world, but this isn't accurate and it would be closer to render it in modern English as the claim that art recreates the creative principle of created things. Well, what does that mean? Coming before Aristotle, Plato had come up with the notion that behind things are ideas, and ideas are perfect theoretical versions of things which exist imperfectly in our flawed reality. Plato also thought that knowledge consists of elevating ourselves through dialectics from the world of sensible reality to the world of eternal ideas. Now, one way Aristotle modified and developed these ideas was with the notion that in reality, in the world, everything naturally tends towards perfection, to these platonic ideal versions of themselves. Boal summarizes this idea in the following terms. Man tends to health, to perfect bodily proportion, etc. And men as a whole tend to the perfect family, to the state. Trees tend to the perfection of the tree, that is, to the platonic idea of a tree. Love tends to the perfect platonic love. Thus, returning to literature, drama, and art, for Aristotle to imitate meant to recreate that internal movement of things towards their perfection. So instead of merely saying that art imitates nature, we can say more clearly that for Aristotle, the essence of art is that it contains an artificial version of a natural principle which exists everywhere in reality, driving things towards the perfect versions of themselves. Boal writes that in the Aristotelian worldview, Man, as part of nature, also has certain ends in view. Health, gregarious life in the state, happiness, virtue, justice, etc. Thus, the function of art, and Aristotle talks specifically about tragedy here, is as a sort of corrective measure to ensure that mankind continues to head towards its ideal state, as this natural tending towards perfection isn't infallible, as shown by phenomena such as wars or illness. And for Aristotle, mankind's ideal state is in an ideal state. Let me explain. Essentially, Aristotle thought that all the arts and sciences of society were interlinked, in a complex hierarchy. Let me give you a modern example of what this means. When I make a video, there's a few different steps. I have to research it, so watching or reading stuff and coming up with my own interpretation of the material. I have to write the video's script, I have to record it, I have to edit the video together, and then finally I have to create a thumbnail. So the art of YouTube content creation encompasses many lesser arts, including reading comprehension, oratory, video editing, and digital artistry. In the Aristotelian worldview, all society is like a giant scaled up version of this, with major arts arts such as diplomacy or war being comprised of many lesser arts and themselves comprising even bigger, more general categories. But again, quoting Boal's reading of Aristotle, Medicine, war, architecture, etc., minor and major arts, all without exception, are subject to and make up a sovereign art. That sovereign art is politics, the running of the state. It governs every aspect of life, and thus the greatest good possible is the political good, because it's the most influential over the rest of life. So if man naturally tends towards perfection, and the creation of perfect virtuous life is possible through the field of politics, that sovereign art which governs all others, then the corrective power of art and drama, particularly tragedy, must be directed in part towards correcting the political virtues of its audience, whatever that might entail. Spoiler alert, we're gonna find out. Okay, are you still with me? That's pretty much the most conceptually complicated this is going to get, and I promise we'll get to Marvel soon. But if art, if drama, if tragedy is to do this, then how is this corrective process affected? Well, it's to do with something you may already have heard of, catharsis. In the modern world, catharsis tends to be conceptualized as the emotional release we the audience experience vicariously through our bond with characters. The end of WandaVision, where Wanda confronts her mistakes, releases the Hex and sacrifices her family? That's cathartic, because we feel the same grief Wanda does in that instant. And seeing that pain, experiencing it with someone else, helps us understand it and helps us feel ready to bear similar pains in our own lives. That moment in Joker 
Joker, where funny face paint man quickscopes Robert De Niro. That's modern catharsis too, albeit in a slightly darker way. The moments at the end of every rom-com where the leads admit that they love each other or whatever. That's catharsis too, and so on. From the beginning, catharsis has been understood to hold the power of purifying ourselves from darker emotions, particularly pity or fear. But if we go back to Aristotle, the ultimate source for our idea of catharsis, Boal suggests that the original catharsis wasn't quite the same as our idea of it today. Instead, it was actually a powerful coercive political tool. Boal follows S. H. Butcher's reading of catharsis, in which Butcher reads catharsis through the lens of Aristotle's other works on politics and ethics. The upshot of this is the idea that, as noted earlier, man has certain ideal states towards which he naturally health and happiness, achieved in part through participation in a well-functioning political system. But, and I'm quoting, when he fails in the achievement of those objectives, the art of tragedy intervenes. This correction of man's actions is what Aristotle calls catharsis. So, catharsis emerges as the tool by which art corrects the flaws of the world, and this is linked to its power of purifying emotions, but how exactly? Well, Boal makes a startling claim. He suggests that if you study the texts Aristotle is discussing, it becomes clear that in these tragedies, the characters don't really experience pity and fear alongside the audience. Rather, pity and fear are what links the audience to the character. He gives an example in Sophocles' plays on Oedipus. Oedipus is a great king, the people love him, his government is perfect, and for this reason we feel pity that such a wonderful person is destroyed for having one fault, pride, which perhaps we also have, hence our fear. We aren't sharing fear and pity with the characters then, we are fearful and pitiful on their behalf. In this conception of catharsis, returning to the example from WandaVision earlier, we pity Wanda for going through all that trauma, and we fear that something similar might happen to us. So in this original, perhaps truer Aristotelian catharsis, fear and pity aren't the negative emotions being purged, they're the tools by which other negative emotions are purged. The question then becomes, what are the unpleasant emotions catharsis drains from us? Well, if we remember that for Aristotle, the highest level of happiness is derived through virtue in the greatest possible good, that is the political good, then the most important unpleasant emotions for catharsis to correct would be those which run contrary to a virtuous engagement with the political. That is, those emotions which would lead an individual not to follow the laws and to disrupt the state and the status quo. A quick but important side note here is that Aristotle basically took the political system he lived in to be fundamentally just. In essence, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle proposes the principle that the just is that which is equal, and the unjust that which is unequal. And Aristotle bases his idea of equality on the society he inhabited. I'll quote Boal again to expand on this. Aristotle asks, should we begin with ideal, abstract principles and descend to reality, or on the contrary, should we look at concrete reality and from there ascend toward the principles? Far from any romanticism, he answers, obviously we should start with concrete reality, we must examine empirically the real, existing inequalities, and upon them base our criteria of inequality. This leads us to accept the just as the already existing inequalities. For Aristotle, therefore, justice is already contained in reality itself as it is. He does not consider the possibility of transforming the already existing inequalities, but simply accepts them. Thus, for Aristotle, political virtue, that which every man tends towards naturally and should strive towards, basically means sticking to your allotted place within society and observing its laws. The idea that one society can be unjust and those laws wrong doesn't really come into any of this. Instead, it's about upholding the status quo, even if, as in Aristotle's time, that status quo included something like slavery. 
With this revelation, the corrective purpose of catharsis, and indeed of drama, becomes decidedly darker. Because if catharsis purges spectators of any emotions which might damage an unjust status quo, then its purpose is essentially to pacify an audience through fiction, and to replace unrest or righteous indignation with a mollified calm. Catharsis in this sense, then, is coercive, it's anti-revolutionary, it's what we might call conservative, because its social function is to keep everything just the way it is. No more protests or riots, says Aristotle. Just obey. And remember, this is the heart of Aristotle's conception of drama, the linchpin of the first real piece of literary theory, and a tract which has had an immense impact on literature and drama for hundreds if not thousands of years. It's hard to overstate its influence. Boal summarises the upshot of all of this as follows. Aristotle constructs the first extremely powerful poetic political system for intimidation of the spectator, for elimination of the bad or illegal tendencies of the audience. This system is, to this day, fully utilised not only in conventional theatre, but in the TV soap operas and in Western films as well. Movies, theatre and television united through a common basis in Aristotelian poetics for repression of the people. Okay, great. We've talked about ancient Greek stuff for, like, a really long time. Why does any of this matter? How does it link to the present day? How does it link to Marvel? Did I clickbait you with the title and thumbnail? No, I promise I didn't. Because now we're going to start tying that stuff in. That purgative quality of drama which covertly coerces an audience into abandoning their progressive or revolutionary will has continued to be at the heart of many dramatic forms since Aristotle's times. I'll it with some modifications, and I propose that one of the most obvious places we can see this coercive system of drama is in the current zeitgeist's undisputed ruler, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. To show you what I'm talking about, let me give you some examples of the way Marvel stories shape your opinions. Let's start with Tony in Civil War. This is a film that marketed itself on the subjectivity of its central conflict. Who's right? No one. You choose your side. That was the idea, pushed hard by the marketing. But I don't think the film itself agrees with this. Now, this is a fairly big claim, and it's one I'll argue for properly in the future. But for now, let's just look at the outcome of the film objectively. I think it's fair to say that Tony takes the bigger L here. With this in mind, it's fairly easy to read Tony's role in this film as that of a tragic hero. That is a character who's a great man, near perfect in every way, apart from one single flaw. And it's this flaw which leads to their downfall. The tragic hero dies at the end, or lives, but faces a new reality in which dying would have been preferable. In Civil War, Tony's fatal flaw, or hamartia as the Greeks would say, is his impulsiveness. The way he makes his choices based not on logic and firmly held principles, but on emotional reactions. We see moments demonstrating this throughout the film. He initially decides to support the Sokovia Accords, not due to his politics, but due to shame. Both over the incident in Lagos, and more obviously, after being confronted by Bizarro Maria Stokes in MIT. He cites the case of her son directly as his reasoning for pushing the accords to his teammates. Oh, that's Charles Spencer, by the way. He's a great kid. He wanted to make a difference, I suppose. I mean, we won't know because we dropped the building on him while we were kicking ass. That's one death. Among others, sure, but had the Avengers not intervened in Sokovia, the whole world would have died, including that boy. Now, morality isn't a zero-sum game, and the fact that the Avengers saved more lives than they took doesn't just absolve them of all responsibility instantly, but that being said, Tony's argument is not a logical or philosophical one. It's plainly based in guilt. So that's what starts all of this, but there's two more key points where Tony's impetuous emotional reactions are important. At the the airport, where he doesn't listen to Steve's explanation. Your old war buddy killed innocent people yesterday. And there are five more super soldiers just like him. I can't let the doctor find him first, Tony. I can't. All right. I've run out of patience. Underoos! And also at the Hydra compound, where he attacks Bucky in a moment of pure emotion. As a result of these decisions, particularly the latter, Tony is defeated. 
He doesn't die, but the Avengers are toast, and as a direct result of his flawed decision-making process, he has to face the fact that half his friends hate him and are in jail because of him. And looking further to the future, it's these decisions which are largely responsible for Thanos winning in Infinity War, and half of the universe being vaporised. Truly, from Tony's perspective, being responsible for all of this is a fate worse than death. So, in Civil War, Tony functions as a tragic hero. According to Aristotle and the ideas we've been discussing, the catharsis we feel at his downfall and Cap and Bucky's escape floods over us, drilling into our relieved minds the lesson that Tony was wrong, we shouldn't be like him, make the same mistakes. But here's the trick. We're not only thinking of Tony's reactionary nature here, because for this entire film, Tony has stood for the Sokovia Accords, which stand for the restriction of individual liberty and agency, and the expansion of governmental or institutional authority. Essentially, it's the classic safety versus freedom dichotomy, and Tony is on Big Brother's side. So when we see him fall, when the moment of catharsis pushes us to condemn Tony's flawed mindset, Civil War is also pushing us to condemn this political idea. And and to be clear, I'm not at all saying that I'm on Tony's side here. I'm just pointing out that as far as I can tell, the mechanics of catharsis in this film are nudging the audience towards a liberal-minded conclusion. Freedom good, restrictions bad. Those who give up liberty for safety deserve neither, and all that. Similar phenomena are observable across Marvel's oeuvre. It doesn't always occur identically. After all, drama has changed lots since Aristotle. There isn't always a clear-cut tragic hero like this, and there doesn't always need to be. The coercive capacity of catharsis can operate in slightly different ways, but for some more or less similar examples, we'd be better served looking at Marvel's villains. A very similar dynamic to that of Tony's in Civil War is observable in The Winter Soldier's Alexander Pierce, except perhaps more exaggerated. You could make the argument that Pierce wanted to make the world a safer and more orderly place, a noble goal in and of itself, but that his mistake was to seek this peace through the violently imposed order and autocracy of Project Insight. When he's defeated, the catharsis similarly reaffirms Cap's contrasting ideas of freedom and free will. In fact, the oft-noted Marvel phenomenon whereby the hero defeats a dark version of themselves, who had maybe somewhat noble intentions but misguided methods, a la Killmonger or Carly Morgenthau, but then pledges to take up their cause the right way, that phenomenon is closely tied to what we're talking about here. Killmonger wanted to violently uplift the powerless, but failed to realise that in some ways that would place them in the same evil position as those who had oppressed them. After defeating him, T'Challa commits to his desire to help the world at the expense of Wakanda's secrecy, and opens outreach centres in less privileged places. Killmonger's ideology is diluted, but a small kernel of it has been taken up by T'Challa. Similarly, in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Kali wants to reorder the world in a more equitable and stateless way, since the geopolitics of the blip demonstrated such a change was possible and beneficial. She furthers this goal, though, with murder. After dying herself, Sam Wilson takes up her cause and presses the GRC about their resettlement plans, winning a minor legislative victory. This phenomenon is similar to what we've been talking about already, because a fear-based catharsis acting towards the audience based on our concern and detachment for the protagonists assures us that these radical villains were wrong to go to extremes, while a pity-based catharsis produced as these villains show their humanity just before dying convinces us and our protagonists that their ideals might have been acceptable if pursued within the tolerated boundaries of society, law, and order. Hence the outreach programs, hence Sam's speech. Interestingly though, this last case reveals the flaws of this approach. Because if you were watching The Falcon and the Winter Soldier when it came out, you'll likely remember that this ending with the speech, Sam telling the council to do better, wasn't brilliantly received. People noted that this resolution didn't come close to addressing the valid concerns raised by the Flag Smashers and the show vis-a-vis -vis borders, structural violence, and systemic racism. Because here's the thing, nothing fundamentally changed. Skip forward a bit in the MCU timeline to something like Hawkeye or No Way Home, and there's still countries, there's still borders, and society looks pretty similar. Those outreach centres have been open for nearly a decade by MCU 2025, and there's no significant technological or social effects observable. Because the thing is, just like Aristotle himself, the MCU is only able to conceive of the world more or less as it is. The ideological nudges which result from all the catharsis in the MCU point in the same 
same direction, towards the center, the status quo. Cap's ideology prevails in his films against the would-be authoritarians who threaten the dominant ideology of Western liberalism, and the peaceful incrementalism of projects like Black Panther or The Falcon and the Winter Soldier nudges our heroes away from radicalism or anarchism and back towards this same liberal status quo. To be clear, I'm not in a million years saying Killmonger was right. His ideology was deeply flawed from the start, and that's a topic I'm hoping to cover in its own video one day. I'm just pointing out the way the MCU's cathartic ideological coercion works. And this is how it works. The ideology of the MCU is moderate, maybe socially centre-left in American terms, like Biden vibes, but generally small-c conservative. It persuades its characters and its audience against radical changes, be they anarchist or authoritarian, and its principal tool is catharsis in a modern-day version of what Boal termed Aristotle's coercive system of tragedy. But the reason we were unsatisfied with this mechanism mechanism after the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is the same reason Aristotle's defense of his own slavery-infested system doesn't sit right with the modern reader. And that's because a system of virtue based around the self-evident rightness of the status quo starts to fail if that status quo is observably cruel and unjust. When Sam does his little speech and fails utterly to enact or even really recognize the valid sweeping critiques offered by the Flag Smashers, the coercion hidden behind the catharsis fails. The curtain is drawn back and we see the failures of our own politics laid bare. And that would be great if it wasn't entirely unintentional. Now, at this point, you might have a few counterpoints. First, you might say the fact that the MCU, Hollywood's biggest cash cow, subtly directs its audience away from radical thought, which could oppose the modern neoliberal status quo, isn't the biggest bombshell in the world. And I'd agree, but I'd also point out that the main objective of this video isn't to assert that claim, it's to investigate how it's accomplished, the mechanics by which the normative ideology is upheld. And you might also rightly point out that this coercive system of catharsis isn't at all unique to the MCU, and that other films often do a similar thing. And okay, while that's true, I'd like to contend that there's another, a more specific link between the stories and characters of the MCU and the way it pushes a centrist politics. But what is that link? Well, to answer that, we have to jump back in time again, this time to the Italian Renaissance and a certain fella by the name of Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli, or Big Nicky M as his friends called him, was writing and thinking at a time of great change in European society. Now, a great deal was altered during the Renaissance across every aspect of life, but all the background we really need for this section is that when it came to class, the European early modern period saw the beginnings of a fundamental power shift. Feudalism and the hierarchical inherited power of the aristocracy was beginning to wane as early forms of capitalism started to become more influential. Merchants and businessmen were gaining power and wealth at unprecedented levels, a precursor to the way they, you know, run the world today. Boal writes, In the new society, organized on accounting principles, the individual ability and value of each man became more important than the social estate in which they were born. But while the bourgeois gained power and influence, Boal continues, in spite of all those social changes, the bourgeois suffered a great disadvantage in comparison to the feudal lord. While the latter could assert that his power emanated from what was in effect a contract made back in immemorial times, in which God himself had given him, the feudal lord, the right to possess the land, together with the right of being God's representative on earth, the bourgeois could allege nothing in his own defense, unless it were his enterprising spirit, his own individual value and ability. Bourgeois power, therefore, rested on the individual value of man living in the concrete circumstances of the real world. The bourgeois owed nothing to his fate or his good fortune, but only to his own virtue. In essence, this virtue is a concept of Machiavelli's, which refers to an essential quality of willpower and ability to get things done. It has some military associations in some of his work, and is often related to his ideas about statesmanship, but if you look at the play he wrote, Mandragola, we see that Machiavelli understood virtue to work in a personal, private sense too. 
Virtue in the Aristotelian sense of moderation, following the laws and accepting your place in an aristocratic hierarchy, didn't fit this new class of movers and shakers, the bourgeoisie, as well as this new Machiavellian virtue did. But this new virtue wasn't a moral virtue, it wasn't about being good, it was about your ability to exercise power as an individual and exert your will upon the world, and as such, it was a perfect fit for the newly powerful bourgeoisie, because they need new values. And I'm not talking about the Iggy Pop album either. Boel writes that Machiavelli himself criticised the bourgeoisie of his own time, accusing it of placing too much value on tradition, of dreaming excessively of the romantic rules of the feudal nobility, thereby weakening itself and delaying the consolidation of its positions and the creation of its own values. This new society had to produce inevitably a new type of art, radically different. And this new art was to be found in the theatre, with new plays and playwrights, principally Shakespeare, who wrote characters in a new way, as individuals, not merely walking figures of allegory and metaphor, which tended to be the norm in medieval theatre. Shakespeare's characters, particularly his villains, display Machiavellian virtue, taking advantage of their willpower and potential, trying to eliminate every trace of emotion, living in a purely intellectual and calculating world. Of course, these were the villains of the plays, but per Boal, Shakespeare expressed the new bourgeois values which were then arising, even if legality and feudalism are the apparent victors at the end of his plays. As a result, the entire body of Shakespeare's dramatic works serves as documentary evidence of the coming of the individualised man in the theatre. And just as the individual took the dramatic world by storm, individualism and liberalism were becoming dominant trends politically and philosophically. Over the next space of time, towards the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, we see virtue and related ideals driving thought, economy and ideology, particularly in the writings of the so-called classical liberals such as Adam Smith and Thomas Paine. A country was even ostensibly founded on these principles. You might have heard of it, it's called the USA. Machiavellian virtue, though, can be seen as one of the core principles of bourgeois thought, then and even now, through pervasive ideals such as the ability to pull oneself up by one's own bootstraps, financially speaking. An image originally posed ironically, by the way, but one which has since somehow morphed into largely sincere usage. It's also visible in so-called great man history, the still common way of conceptualising historical events as determined almost entirely by a few superior men, such as Julius Caesar, Napoleon or Martin Luther, rather than as a complex interconnected web of events stemming from the effects of innumerable structures and people. Thank perennial stinker Thomas Carlyle for that one. The point is, though, to quote Boal, that the bourgeoisie asserted one type of exceptional condition as opposed to another, the extraordinary individual in contrast to those privileged by a state. According to virtue and similar ideas at the heart of bourgeois ideology then and now, reality is defined by the wealthy and the powerful, and that's not because of luck or material factors. It's because they're better than you. They're stronger, smarter, more detached, more able to exert their will upon the world. They're exceptional. They're super. This leads us to the other, more insidious arm of the MCU's ideology. Because our heroes are often bourgeois individualism personified, in that they are genuinely above us. They possess extraordinary qualities. Even the human, unenhanced ones can take extreme punishments and pull off objectively superhuman feats. But it goes deeper than just physical attributes and accomplishments, because there's a tendency in these films, particularly in the last films in trilogies, to suggest that even the most powerful of these characters are special not because of their technology or abilities, but because of their spirit or other similar ineffable qualities. Iron Man 3 shows us that Tony Stark's real strength isn't the suit that he wears, but his intelligence, adaptability and guts. The last two Captain America films tell us that Steve's most important strength comes not from the super soldier serum, but from commitment to idealism and his ability to inspire others to stand up for their shared principles. We see this when he gives the speech of the Triskelion in Winter Soldier, as well as in the way he manages to convince half of the Avengers to fight against the Accords, including, crucially, Natasha. While things are superficially different in Thor Ragnarok on account of our titular hero being, you know, a god, there's nevertheless a similar dynamic at work there too, as the Lord of Thunder realises his powers come not from his hammer, but from within him, and from his love for his people. 
This pattern and other related ones can be found across the MCU, and as a result, I think it's fair to say that in this world, the heroes aren't just heroes because of the abilities bestowed upon them from one source or another. No, they are innately heroic, and they change their world just as much through their superior personal qualities, their superior willpower, and so forth. They are modern-day Napoleons, great men and women who shape reality through something closely resembling Machiavelli's virtue, the central bourgeois principle of individualism and liberalism. As a result, Civil War can propose that a cabal of these supermen should be able to operate above the will of the normal world, and partially via the catharsis method suggested above, it gets us to agree. What emerges then is a cinematic universe which uses a two-pronged approach to coerce its audiences to passively accept the ideology and narratives of the bourgeoisie, or in modern terms, the neoliberal order, the principles of late capitalism. First, the coercive potential of catharsis is employed through the fates met by Marvel's tragic heroes and villains. Second, the very nature of these characters is fundamentally rooted in Machiavellian virtue and the individualist exceptionalism peddled by bourgeois myths. The upshot of this is a series of films which turns our own emotions against us in order to reduce radical thought and parades in front of us examples of successful beings, successful due to essential qualities and virtue, supposedly out of reach for us, the lowly 99%. In doing so, even the more politically minded MCU entries naturally and inevitably tend towards moderate milk toast messaging. The flag smashers are wrong, changing the system in any way is wrong. Criticising bourgeois values is wrong. The thing is, Marvel's writers aren't even necessarily aware of this dimension of their work. Gestures towards progressivism are routinely made, but the ongoing faux realism of the MCU, combined with the inherent ideological normativity we've discussed, means that even more politically charged installments are necessarily crippled in what they're able to say. And so, the essential conservatism of modern drama is revealed, fundamentally unchanged since Aristotle's day. Stories are still used to pacify the masses and defend the status quo, whether it be the patriarchal slave-holding aristocracy of ancient Greece or the institutional violences of late capitalism. What has changed in 2000 years? Perhaps not as much as you might think. So there's the big argumentative money shot. But it's not all doom and gloom, because there are other options, other routes drama can take to avoid the necessarily conservative implications of standard cathartic resolutions. And one of these lies in Bertolt Brecht's alienation effect, or Verfremdung's effect. Essentially, with Brechtian theatre, the idea is to avoid the sort of close emotional connections with the characters which would lead to powerful cathartic moments. Instead, the audience is constantly reminded of the theatre's artificiality and remains emotionally speaking at an arm's length from the events of the drama. As such, they are more able to observe the lessons of the drama from a logical and disinterested viewpoint. With Brechtian drama, then, the coercive potential of catharsis is negated. Or even if we ditch Brecht and remain with the MCU, it's not necessarily direct and unambiguous brainwashing. In the third edition of Cultural Theory and Popular Culture, an introduction, John Story claims that some see popular culture as a struggle between the resistance of subordinate groups in society and the forces of incorporation operating in the interests of dominant groups in society, such as the bourgeoisie. In this view, popular culture isn't merely a uniform canvas for the dominant powers in society to push their ideology to the rest of us, but popular culture can be a terrain of negotiation between the two, a terrain marked by resistance and integration. Thus, while popular culture such as the MCU might contain coercive or propagandistic elements, that doesn't necessarily mean that the entire project is unambiguously normative. There might be pockets of resistance within a work which largely supports a dominant ideology. And I think if we are to continue engaging with products like Marvel films, it's these pockets of cultural resistance we need to look to and amplify. Perhaps the reason that a series like The Falcon and the Winter Soldier feels so ideologically confused is that it's an example of one of these contested cultural terrains, where radical ideas such as those espoused by the Flag Smashers meet textual and structural forces supportive of the status quo, and where the resolutions for these conflicts are a little messy. 
Because even if unintentional, these moments reveal that socially dominant ideologies are never omnipotent, and that resistance and dissent tend to find their way into cultural products, even if these products are produced by a multi-billion dollar franchise. But I think that's about it. I'm sorry this conclusion isn't more clear cut, but I think the ambiguity of this ending note reflects the uncertainty of the present moment. As we enter an epoch of human history where rapid fundamental changes to our cultures and lifestyles will be necessary to survive as a species, it remains unclear whether our culture, our fiction, our drama and our cinema have the potential to bring about this change, or whether, as Aristotle thought all those years ago, they are but instruments of normative political coercion. But if you've made it to the end of this video, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What did you think of the arguments I presented, or my readings of the films and shows I've discussed? Do you think there's a propagandistic element inherent in popular drama and cinema? Or do you think there is genuinely revolutionary potential in the popular fiction of tomorrow? Let me know in the comments. This video is the first of a series of community videos, for which the Patreon supporters of this channel can suggest and vote upon topics for me to cover. If that sounds like a process which would interest you, check out my Patreon linked below, or just check back here in a month or so, because the next community video will probably be out by then. They won't all be this long though, because I don't really have time to make long form content like this in addition to my normally scheduled uploads. This one is a bit of a mammoth though, because when I saw that this topic won the vote, I knew that I had to try to do it justice. So a special thanks to Ian Fifield for suggesting it, and thanks to the rest of my patrons on screen now for picking it. And to everyone else, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope to see you again soon.